So welcome one and all. I'm uh, Don Haas, the Director of Teacher Programming at the Paleontological Research Institution. And I will also be a panelist today with my colleagues, uh, Terry Jordan and, and Rob Ross. Um, but uh, we will start off with announcements before we get to our uh, presentation today. So uh, any announcements? I have one. Nope. Um, you know, the, the wheel never stops turning at the AMS education program as we offer different teacher programming year round, but the uh, registration process for the 55th consecutive semester of the data stream program is opening today so that teachers who'd like to take courses this spring are able to enroll and get matched with a mentor. And the course that's most relevant to clean is the data stream Earth's climate system course, which is the semester long graduate credit course um, in learning the basics of climate, climate science and climatology. And uh, it's a rare opportunity, don't get to say this too often, but they, if anyone's interested or knows someone that might be interested, we'd appreciate sharing the information out. This is the last chance to take that course for a while because we're pausing next academic year for the first time. So I won't be able to say consecutive after um, the spring semester. The first 35 people that sign up can take the course at no cost whatsoever. So we're excited, yay. Cool. Why is there going to be a pause? Sorry, I got a tickle in my throat right at, <laughs> at the mm. end of talking. Mm. The pause is a really exciting opportunity that our grant that supports the courses, I'm sorry, <clears throat> our grant that supports the courses is giving us a one-year pause to retool some of the pedagogical approaches that we're taking in the class. Nice. Yeah, it's great. And Gina's got a hand up. Um, that's very exciting, Wendy. Congrats on that. Um, I have two things. So the first is that um, I mentioned this uh, last week, but um, the right here, right now, Global Climate Summit is happening at CU Boulder um, in December, and we are hosting a um, teacher workshop, and um, the deadline to apply is tomorrow. Oh, no. I think we moved it, sorry. The deadline is tomorrow. <clears throat> so the link I just shared is um, not up to date, but um, within the next day, if you know any teachers that live in the area or uh, pre-service teachers that want to join us for that workshop, um, that would be really helpful. Um, we'll be um, uh, working on curriculum for climate teaching climate change through a human rights lens. Um, and they'll be um, continuing, continuing graduate credits available for that um, opportunity. Um, so there's that, I put the link in the chat. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that Clean is launching a um, campaign to understand how our resources are used in the classroom. Um, I'll put the link in the chat as well right there. So basically we want to know how Clean has served you um this is a very short um technically a survey but we essentially just want testimonials um written or video about how clean resources have helped you um we're just collecting um qualitative data on on that so if you or any teachers that you know want to provide a testimonial you'll get a ten dollar gift card um if you do it and it would be helping clean out a lot. So either yourself, or if you wanna share it, um, that would be super helpful and very appreciated. <laughs> so that is my stuff. Other announcements? I have one different from what we're gonna talk about today. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. We're, and I mentioned this last week, we're gonna be, 
hosting an author event with uh, James D'Amico on Tuesday, December 13th, on his uh, just published book, Confront Climate, Change, Climate Denial, Literacy, Social Studies, and Climate Change, or How to, Front, uh, how to Confront Climate Denial, that is. Um, and uh, um, the, well, it's, uh, the book is focused on the social studies. Um, the talk will be uh, of interest across the disciplines. Uh, some of the info is in the chat there and I'm working on our newsletter that'll have the, the bigger, more formal looking announcement that'll go out, I, I hope in the next 24 to 48 hours. And I'll send that out on the green list. So we just um, made a new, oh, sorry, um, made a new electricity calculator, web-based electricity calculator, just put it in the chat, um, which will be used for hopefully students and adults. I've been working on some adult education um, content as well for Alaska-based, but this doesn't, you don't have to be in Alaska to use this. You do have to know your own electricity rate, um, but hopefully that can be of use and I'm excited for it to be used and hopefully accessible for folks who don't have like Excel or, or Google Sheets and stuff like that. Other announcements? <clears throat> Frank has his hand up. Go ahead, Frank. Sorry, I'm multitasking. <laughs> okay, I just popped uh, a um, URL into the um, into the chat box for something I just saw. That was a special <laughs> session at uh, COP twenty seven. Uh, something a uh, tool is called Climate Trace. Is anybody familiar with this? Uh, this is something that Al Gore was involved with, but basically. It's a project um, being able, rather than depending on self-reporting for emissions, is actually using remote sensing and ground-based uh, monitoring to actually come out with uh, alternative to uh, what could be a twisted story from some of the, the reporters. Anyway, it's uh, called Climate Trace. Yeah, and uh, I actually um, did hear an interview with him on NPR yesterday or the day before about it. And it sounds very interesting. And I meant to go and look for it. So thank you for <laughs> thank you. Thank you for finding it for me. Any other announcements? Okay. We will go ahead and dig in and we have a a Google Doc with links to the stuff we're going to talk about today. And um I will share screen. Um, what um, that that Google document is is basically a lightly edited one from a workshop that Terry and I did uh, last week at the Science Teachers Association of New York State. We're not going to do the same presentation we did from them. We're going to just kind of draw some excerpts from it. Um, and uh, we've done the clean announcements. Um, and I forgot to uh, click the uh, share audio. So hopefully this will cooperate. Um, although the audio actually in this is not so important, we'll talk over it some. Um, once it loads, which I meant to do before we started. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about uh, Cornell's Deep Geothermal Research Project and the Kubo piece of that. Kubo is the Cornell University Borehole Observatory. Um, and we drilled a, a we, um, the royal we that is, <laughs> drilled a two mile deep hole on uh, the Cornell campus this summer. And um, that was completed in August. And if this video loads, we will look at it. And if it doesn't, we won't. <laughs> and maybe we won't. Um, it it, uh, it gives a, a video montage of uh, the experience of drilling this summer. I'm going to stop it and see if I can click and reload. We'll make it load. Count 
concern it, as they say. Um, so maybe that won't work. Or maybe one of my colleagues can, with a faster operating computer, can share their screen instead of me. Um, my computer seems to be in slow-mo. Mm. So, um, Robert Terry, can you pick it up since uh, my... Yeah, I will have to... I didn't have the link open, so uh, take me a minute to, to grab it. Okay. You could give some more context, maybe. Sure. Uh, I do have it open if you want. Okay. Okay, why don't we look up Terry? Okay, so I Here. should... <laughs> I cannot share screen while the other participant right, is sharing. Right, and I am clicking on it to stop sharing, but my slow motion computer is not registering <laughs> that I'm clicking on it. Um, so, um, so the idea here uh, is that um, more than 40% of Cornell's energy use is, um, is for heating campus. And that is currently done with the combined heat and power plant that's now natural gas fired. It was uh, built as the coal fired power plant, um, but that's about 40% or more than 40% of Cornell's energy use. So um, as part of the plan to get to um, uh, um, zero carbon emissions by 2035. Transitioning away from... <laughs> okay, the video sound is playing. Can you see my screen? I cannot. I am trying oh. to stop sharing, and maybe I'll actually. Force actually, it. I think you you have. I stopped. stopped sharing. I stopped oh, your okay. sharing, Don. Okay. So Thank I you. think Terry should be able to now, but uh, I don't right. see your screen either. I don't either. Um, well, then let me start that maneuver again. Maybe there was a yeah. sequencing thing here. Yeah, and I'm actually thinking maybe I'll quit Zoom and come back in. Maybe. Can you now see the screen? Not yet. Still no. I'm going to quit Zoom and come back in and see if that helps. Sorry about that. No worries, Tom. We all been there. Will we all quit with him? No, I guess no. Mm -hmm. Well, I could go ahead with his context then. I I won't reproduce him. Um. So, <sighs> because Cornell has committed to becoming free of carbon. Um, in its all campus, campus operations by 2035, which is a really short deadline. Um, and because 40% of, almost 50% of the campus energy use is for heating, um, rather than just saying, oh, we'll convert everything to electricity, because doing that for heating would double or triple our electricity use, um, we're trying to tap into naturally available geothermal energy under our feet. And um, it is also, we're doing it because it's part of the university's mission to make breakthrough things happen rather than just buy things off the shelf. So um, I think Don, who is back, may have wanted to say something about energy transition in general. And um, we won't show the video until after he says whatever he's going to say. Mm -hmm. I think we can go ahead and show the video and I'll say a little bit about that. You think, well, that's only if people will be able to see it. Oh, okay. Are you still not able to share? There we go. Now we can oh, you can? Okay. So it was you, Don. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to play this, including the sound. Fossil fuel-based energy sources can help reduce the impact of climate change. When we change our energy source, we change history. The future of energy worldwide needs to be without carbon in the energy source. There are limited choices of how to get energy, but one of them that's distributed everywhere that people live is to go underground to where the rocks are hot. We have almost infinite energy right below our feet pretty much everywhere in the world. It's available 24 seven all the time. And if we can just figure out how to use it efficiently, it really solves our energy problems in ways that other renewable sources don't.
we had sound but don't anymore, or at least I don't. I don't know. This is Kubo behind us. So in its condition right now, it allows us to, to make it into a long-term observatory. In those different ports and valves and everything, we can put scientific instruments down inside of the well. We've been able to characterize the deep uh, ground underneath here that is representative of much of New York State and not much of the Northeast. We did a lot of testing of the borehole of that open section between 8,000 feet to 10,000 feet deep. And we could see in there the fractures, particularly in these zones that we think might be potential reservoirs. That's really good because those fractures could be the places where we allow the fluids to flow in uh, from one well to the other well and absorb a lot of heat. We have lots of data now and lots of attention needs to be brought to that data to kind of figure out, so what's next? Already Kubo has been a, a great success. It's a success in that all of our students like Roberto and others are learning how to do this and how to essentially be the leaders that develop this and do geothermal energy throughout the United States and throughout the world. Don, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Struggling, struggling. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna try screen sharing again. And here is, we're just gonna take a look at just a bit of um, the slides that we shared at this uh, Stannis meeting, the Science Teachers Association of New York State meeting last week. Um, and uh, um, I think uh, a, a couple of, of points that I like to raise again and again. Um, talking about climate change without talking about energy is like talking about lung cancer without talking about uh, smoking. I don't think we talk about fire enough. And part of the goal of Kubo is to move away from fire. Um, and uh, folks, the, the man on the street or woman on the street does not really know what GHG emissions means. Um, but everybody knows what fire is. And I also think it's very much worth noting that for 90% of Earth history, there was essentially no fire because all the fuel was underwater and there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere. And it's also, as we've talked about on, on this call many times before, the best way to reduce anxiety is to reduce the threat causing the anxiety. Um, one of the things that... Um, uh, I like to also bring attention to is how incredibly rapidly the energy uh, system is changing in the US. Um, those are the largest uh, sources of energy used in New York State in alphabetical order, in rank order, they look like this. Most folks don't know that. Um, and I think uh, I'm trying to figure out how to change our energy system. We should start with. Uh, um, some knowledge of where we're getting our energy uh, from now. And um, I think this set of questions uh, you could spend hours <laughs> talking about. Um, it really, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that teachers noted is most surprising is that there's no coal in that list. And some folks thought coal was the biggest source of energy in New York State. Um, we haven't burned any coal except in um, a few people heating their houses and uh, some industrial processes in the state in the last couple of years. Um, and it's really interesting, too, how uh, downstate and upstate have very different energy portfolios. 
Um, but we're not going to talk about that now for the sake of time. But I just want you to know it's there. And um, now getting uh, a little look at um, uh, heating use within buildings. This is energy related carbon di dioxide uh, emissions um, from residential and commercial buildings. And you can see that um, electricity uh, peaked around 2007 or 2008 or something like that. Um, but the uh, commercial direct use, which depending on how you define direct use, includes heating. This does include, uh, in this graph, it does include heating. And you can see that stayed virtually flat. It is very much worth noting, however, that um, efficiency has improved a lot because there's a lot more square footage of um, building now than there was in 1990. I think it's about 20% more building uh, space than there was then. So even though that looks flat, um, it's only sort of flat. Um, and we're not going to dig into that. Um, and uh, this is looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, related to um, uh, electricity generation. And, and I think this is quite an interesting graph. It puts list coal and natural gas and petroleum fire generation separately and lumps all the zero carbon generation together. And you can see in the last couple of years that um, zero carbon generation has tied with natural gas. And I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and um, wind has overtaken um, hydro as the second largest zero carbon source in uh, the US in the last, this year, it looks like it'll stick. Um, and uh, I also think it's very much worth pondering how technology is cool um, in that uh, improvements in technology are, are cooler than what came before. Um, methane burns at 35, almost 3,600 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, for most uses, we don't need that, including heating buildings. And um, uh, I, you know, in our homes, we don't need to do anything at 3,600 degrees. Um, and in our, uh, to move our cars around, we also don't need the many hundreds of degrees that uh, uh, happens when you burn gasoline. Uh, and um, so uh, new technologies are not only cool as in nifty, they are very often cooler as in lower temperatures. And I think I'm going to hand it off to Terry for talking more Kubo-ish. And you're going to share your own screen, right, Terry? That's right. I'm going to share my own screen. Okay. So having practiced this, I ought to be able to do it right. Huh? Which of my two screens are you seeing? Are you seeing presentation or the one, the two parts? All right. I'm even better off than usual. Okay. So, um, so I, I will say that the reason to bring this story to you all is in well, part of it is, yeah, we think it's cool. Cornell is trying this. It, there's no guarantee it will work, but it's trying it. But it's also because Rob and Don of PRI and I and a collaborator who's a filmmaker um, have been working for well over a year to you know, really figure out how to communicate basic STEM information, as well as energy and climate information to the public. And the public is in part K-12, and it's part, you know, just our, our neighboring citizens who don't know what we're doing. Um, so we, and we thought that while to the geologist, there's nothing more exciting than a picture of the cross-section of Earth the earth down to the core where it's 6,000 degrees Celsius. And, you know, to explain geothermal energy from uh, principles of heat conduction kind of physics and geology, why is it hot? Um, we also think 
there's a whole lot of people who just will find a um, 150 foot tall drilling mast in the middle of Ithaca to be an attention grabber. <laughs> and they will pay attention to whatever's going on in a way that they never would if I showed up with my geological diagram. So um, we, we are, the three of us and, and Deborah Horde are promoting knowledge about how earth system operates and we're promoting knowledge about energy transitions. Um, Ithaca, New York is not located in, I'll put my star where we are located. We are not located in a place where the, the red color pattern on the global heat flow map indicates that uh, we would have, oops, my cursor went away, um, that we would have particularly favorable geothermal circumstances. The, uh, the geological plate boundaries occur where it's dark red, where the volcanoes are what the triangles are. It's like all the manifestations of heat are far from upstate New York. And uh, correspondingly, these uh, green Cheerios show you where there are geothermal power plants around Earth. And they're located where the colors are either red or deep pink. And our Ithaca, New York, Blue Diamond is in a comparatively not favorable place for geothermal energy in the conventional. It's been done for 100 years since. Um, as we cross North America or the United States, um, likewise, this is a picture of the variations in heat flowing out of the earth, the amount of magnitude of heat flowing out where red occurs in the Western United States, green because it's cold occurs across the Eastern half of the United States, blue because it's super cold happens in a, a few places. Um, and again, with the Cheerios representing the power plants, you know, conventional geothermal energy is done in the Western US where earth provides a higher flux of heat and it's not typically done in the rest of the continent. However, the, this is a map of where we, the American public uses a lot of heat in our homes or in our buildings. Um, this is the percentage of heat that is you, the percentage of consumed energy that is for the purpose of generating heat. And um, uh, the Northeastern tier of states in general and the Northeastern United States in specific use a large fraction, like 70% in the extremes, that looks like Vermont is around 70%, um, of the energy consumed is to heat our buildings. It's not where we produce geothermal electricity, but it's where we consume heat in buildings. So um, the shifting geothermal energy perception is, well, what do we do differently if we want to take this heat that's provided everywhere across the United States and heat buildings with it. And so that's sort of the domain of Cornell's project. We wouldn't dream of it. there being enough heat accessibility to create electricity, but the heat below our feet is plenty to warm our buildings in principle, if we can get it out. So direct use of heat rather than conversion to electricity is the concept that Cornell is investigating and the Department of Energy has sponsored our work on it thus far, not because they care whether Cornell is warm, but because this is a common situation across the whole Northern tier of states and the Northeastern uh, United States in particular. And if a solution could be made to work in Ithaca, which has nothing particularly favorable about the geological features, it ought to be transferable to some of the rest of the cold area. Um, I had already mentioned that Cornell is uh, dedicated to uh, 
removing carbon from its energy source. Uh, this is what our current energy mix looks like, uh, schematic of the Cornell campus. We have a super efficient use of cold water from Cayuga Lake to refrigerate the campus in summer. We have a hydroelectric plant. Um, you know, the creek isn't big enough to provide more power than, than about one or two percent of the campus's power. Um, we burn natural gas in a combined heat and power plant. And then that heat, like the heat part of the combusted natural gas circulates through this orange thing shows like a track around campus. Well, it's a delivery of hot water and steam to all the buildings for heating them. So the question is, I'm sorry, back up. Um, over here in this diagram, there was the, oh, maybe in the future we could take the heat from underground. And so that could be a substitute, hot geothermal water providing heat instead of burning natural gas providing heat. But it would again be heat fed into this district heating loop. So here are the pieces of how the system is envisioned to work. And you don't have to call it it's a Cornell system. It could be some other location. Um, to use the existing energy distribution system reduces costs. There would have to be at least two wells, one it, going down into rocks that are truly hot enough to um, provide the heat for the buildings, for a whole set of buildings. So in our case, we're looking for rocks hotter than 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And the engineers would love 180 degrees or 200 degrees, but 160 is like the minimum. Hot water, water heated below ground would be pumped out of one. Once its heat is removed for surface use, then the somewhat cooler water would be pumped down the second well. The way the heat is extracted from the geothermal water is through mechanical, well, they're not mechanical devices. It's a very static sort of um, plates of metal with cold water, with the hot water on one side and its heat it just leaks off by conduction over into the um, whatever fluid is on the other side of this steel um, frame, so it's a heat exchanger. And that heat then, um, having heated some much more environmentally benign fluid like regular water would then be what goes through the pipes around campus. So the challenge, that's a great idea that we can write equations and new models that make it look like it'd be very competitive against uh, fossil fuels. But the challenges are that it's actually very costly to drill wells and make this thing work underground. And we don't even know, the second challenge is um, whether money alone will be sufficient <laughs> to make it work, to, to try to get water flowing through rocks enough to harvest the heat is, is actually not um, something that can be taken for granted. So there's a technology development here. We had spent 10 years in a preparatory phase, 12 years, you know, studying the feasibility of this regionally and then zeroing in on would it be feasible at Cornell. But in the most recent year, we, we passed into a real data collection phase. It's like um, we needed to go beyond uh, assumed parameters. Uh, like we assume the rocks can produce as much fluid and instead we have to drill and measure what the rocks really can produce. And right now, having most of the data in hand since summer, but not fully analyzed, now um, experts in subsurface reservoir design are at least developing early models of how might it work so we can decide whether um, the benefits are uh, outweigh whatever 
risks, including money, environmental, and such, exist. So, um, because I showed before that there would be the two wells, one injecting cold water, one returning hot water. What we drill, what we did to gather data, though, was to drill a separate well the yellow straw of this diagram. It's just a data gathering and observation well. It required a drill rig straight out of the gas fields of Pennsylvania. So this is a standard oil and gas type of drilling and exploration um, setup, which in Ithaca could have turned out to be just a lightning rod for protests because uh, Ithaca is ground zero of anti-fracking and all. But uh, that was one reason, the concern that it not be uh, a source of great public controversy was one reason why the university invested in public communication. Um, so we drilled the well, we had specific uh, attributes of the rocks and the fluids and the temperature that we were targeting for data collection. It's drilled roughly a mile from the academic building where I usually would have worked, which is over here on the far left side. It's only several hundred feet distance from other parts of the campus. But so here was our drill rig. Here is the College of Veterinary Medicine as an example. We're really on the periphery of campus. Because it was summer, they didn't draw as much attention as you might have thought. There weren't that many student groups and all the um, people would drop in and sit under our um, public, um, can't see it here. We actually have a tent. So this area between these two trailers became a tent that we had the public visitors at. So, um, we, we've drilled a hole to 9,800 feet deep. Geologists have, a, like me, have a great time learning about the rocks that are down there. And, and now all the data analysis is focused on these lower 2,000 feet where the rocks are somewhere over 80 degrees Celsius. And many, many kinds of data that some of which is actually fairly visually interesting to share with students or public, um, to share data sets with teacher groups who, teachers who may need to use something in their classrooms. And um, there's uh, opportunities for discussing how one drills a well that influences how come the temperature profiles change every single day you measure temperature down in the borehole. Why is it changing through time? Well, there's a lot of interesting physics and engineering lessons in that. But to, to reiterate one of the achievements of the project, we hope we really succeed in getting geothermal energy out of this, but it's also been a wonderful um, training opportunity for students who have the joy of doing something with you know, reality in it. It's not uh, just a computer exercise and something. And, um, and they got to work with our 50 people from the various professional groups who, who were contracted for the, from non-campus organizations. So that's where, what we did. And coming soon will be what we learned from it and how that might or might not lead to completion of the dream of actually creating a geothermal reservoir. And I believe that was my part. Now we would pass yeah, it over to Rob. There is one question in the chat that maybe we'll um, have you answer before uh, handing it off to Rob to say a few words about the uh, website. So, um, a zip line. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the zip line is not the question. The uh, open loop is. <laughs> oh, um, if it's a closed loop, well, the, the 
major question, the major limitation for success of getting enough heat out to do like 20% of campus heating just on the first well page, well pair would be, and there would have to be four, five, six well pairs eventually, each, each pair costing money. Um, it's how much contact area is there or surface area between the rock, which is the hot thing and the borehole. If you use a closed loop system, you rely on your drilled well for the entire contact surface area. And as of this morning, actually, I heard some one of the geothermal engineers who's collaborating with us say to get five megawatts thermal out of a borehole at this temperature, these temperatures, we're talking 80 degrees Celsius, not what they make electricity from, you would have to have 50 miles of borehole. And that's absurdly expensive. So, so if nature will give us fracture systems that already provide a lot of surface area, then we don't need 50 miles of drilling. Okay, Ram, you wanna say a few words about the uh, uh, website? Sure. So uh, you might be wondering, how can I get more information about this? Uh, Terry started this website called Deep Geothermal Heat Research, uh, I think about four years ago now. And originally it was intended to tell the technical story behind the research, and that is still here. It is on the research tab. So the um, maybe Don or Terry will put this website into the chat. It's Deep oh, Geothermal yeah. Heat dot engineering dot Cornell, but that's too long fight to memorize. <clears throat> so um, so this research um, tab part of the website can tell you some of the backstory and the technical details if you're interested in that. As the project was getting to the stage that a hole was going to be drilled, this this uh, um, borehole observatory, and we began, uh, Don and I began to work with Terry on the science education piece uh, and, and the outreach for our, our local community. We expanded the scope of the website to include a variety of kinds of information that would be accessible to a non-technical audience. So that could be the general public, could also be teachers and students. And the homepage, <clears throat> contains, as you might expect, an overview. There are a couple of very nice videos here that kind of give the, uh, uh, produced by Deborah Ford and her company, uh, Photosynthesis Productions, that provide an overview. And, and um, I would encourage you to, to watch these. They tell the story. And if you have, if you know other people who would be interested in this, it's a great way to start. Um, and I'll also advertise that the young woman in this video is Don's daughter, <laughs> who is a, an aspiring actor. Um, so she uh, was one of the narrators, the other one being a graduate student from Earth and Atmospheric Sciences uh, present in these videos as our narrators. <clears throat> we have a science overview section, really science and technology, as Terry said, there are really a couple of foci to this outreach effort. Part of it is about the energy and ultimately also about climate change. And of course that really is the focus of the project, but in terms of getting people interested in why this energy source could exist, we, we were really excited to be able to talk about the local geology and the layers um, directly beneath campus. And that's something that most people never get a chance to hear about unless they see it in their local outcrops. So this tells a variety of stories from both the, the basic geology to how we get heat out of the rocks and, and what are the environmental risks. When um, drilling was about to start in late April, 
we created another tab called Going Deep Summer 22. And this is effectively a blog that kept track on a daily basis what was going on with the drilling. And so if you were so inclined, you could go to this tab and scroll down uh, and then gradually come back up and actually see the story as it emerged. So in this, there are, we actually removed the, the daily updates on, currently we're in this layer and just kept the weekly summaries, but you'll still get a sense of it that, um, excuse me, um, that, uh, where we were in the geology and what it meant in terms of uh, the uh, geothermal heat and so on. So we're going to keep this up because we think it's intriguing. Uh, it's not being updated at the moment because we have finished this phase of the project, but we will take some of this content, reorder it and add it back to the science overview. Then of course, Teacher, our teacher resources. So we have begun this part of the site. We've done some teacher workshops um, and we have some basic contextual information about why this project can be such a great case study for teaching about earth systems and about energy systems. And we'll also continue to add uh, curricula and resources to this part of the website. Um, I should mention before I finish that there are actually two sites uh, about this project. The Cornell administration runs one called Earth Source Heat, which is kind of the, <clears throat> the broad name for, for um, the energy side of the story. And that really tells us, tells about Kubo from the Cornell perspective. It's really the audience is the Cornell communi community broadly. And to some extent, our local community, whereas deep geothermal heat is really focused on the science and technology. There, are, uh, it's intended to make it accessible, but there are some more, there's really more technical side to it. And although it's certainly intended for our local audiences, we also hope that this will be of interest to a national or maybe even an international audience. Uh, and finally, we'll be connecting to be, you know, there, there's obviously a lot to regional geology. And so we also have, TRI has a separate resource called Earth of Home, where we have a lot of content on regional geology, climate and energy and so on. And so rather than reinvent everything for <clears throat> the deep geothermal heat website, uh, when we get to certain parts, we then link to Earth of Home. And I think um, I'll hand it back to you, Don, in case we want to now go to questions. Yeah, I think we're mostly going to go to questions, though. I want to just say a word about workforce stuff. Hmm, and, right. Um, uh, I'm going to play just a, a, a snippet of audio from, well, first, first I'm going to show, play a snippet of video um, from a tour that Rob, uh, Terry, and I had. And uh, by the uh, folks, the drillers on site. And this is one of our two um, tour leaders. And I'm just going to sh show you 15 seconds of hands on the bed earlier. I, I, I'm sure if I show them the photos now, it'll mean more to them. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. So it prevents us from actually getting weight in those cutters in contact with new formation. And, and backing up a tiny bit. Uh, how would you dis describe clay inhibition so an eighth grader could understand it? Okay, so <laughs> clay inhibition. Uh, all the clays want to take in some amount of water. So it's the ability to block that water from reacting with the particles. So it goes on an ionic level of specific ions can block that reaction from happening. So we try to select ions. Potassium chloride is a very good ion for uh, clay inhibition. because So I, that's not really at an eighth grade level, <laughs> um, but I want to play a, a snippet of uh, uh, audio snippet. So yeah, please stay out of the fenced off area. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's, it? what's your education? Uh, high school level. Ninth grade. I'm the 
that ninth grade, high school level. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, these these guys who gave the tour, who are essentially running the rig, um, the two guys that gave us that that are doing that, have high school uh, diploma. One has a high school diploma. One one finished at ninth grade, and um, up until the summer, they were drilling for oil and gas, which I assume is what they're doing again now. Um, but the skill set for drilling for deep geothermal is very, very similar to um, the skill set for drilling for oil and gas. And I was really hoping that Frank Niepold would be on today to um, for me to say that we have these great raw videos, but we don't have the bandwidth right now or the funding to uh, put them together into more polished um, materials. Um, but we we will hopefully figure out a way to do that. Um, so I just wanted to to mention some workforce issues and note that um, the workforce uh, the, about 50 folks working on the site this summer, ranging from a ninth grade education and probably making more than twice as much money as I do um, up to uh, uh, Terry and, and folks like her. Um, so now for the last six minutes, sorry about going so long, I'm gonna open it up for questions. Frank, go ahead. So I got a question that's probably aimed at Teresa, but um, so you've, you've got the two pipes coming down. I mean, the two, two boreholes coming down, you're depending on the fracturing of the rock to be able to, to bring the, the colder fluid up into, up into the collection pipe with the warmer fluid. Um, assuming that this rock's fractured enough to do that, you've got colder water coming in. Is that gonna create a problem with dropping the temperature in the proximity of the uh, of the intake far enough that you start mineralizing and sealing up your fractures? Yes, it is. certainly circulating the water will be in a fight against the heat of the rock. I mean, just as the rock will give up heat to the pipe, the rock will take cold out of the pipe. So, um, you know, the pole, when I say there's technical uncertainties, it's like, what is the rate of extraction that can be sustained for certain volumes of rock and spacings of fractures? That's all completely big question. And these waters, the natural brines that are in the rock are hugely, you know, they ionic, you know, they are um, about as, they are super saturated with salt, essentially. And so um, not having mineral precipitation clog up the pipes and all is, is a very major part of what needs to be designed. They, they succeed in geothermal to achieve that, you know, balance of, of chemistry. But I, I believe that every location like ours will be, you know, the whole new set of problems to be um, analyzed, discovered, and dealt with. Yeah, and it could be crippling. But it's a good chemistry lesson that um, yeah. if, you, if you teach chemistry, it might be good for you. Yes, <laughs> it does look like Eric's having fun out there. Um, <laughs> uh, other questions? Sorry, sorry, I'm not trying to uh, steal anybody's thunder, but, but it just it happens to be a NOAA sponsored thing. So <laughs> I had to like throw it on there for everybody. Very good, very good. Other questions? I, um, and I, I really wanna highlight the idea of um, how we need to stop burning stuff. And uh, if, um, if Kubo works, if the deep geothermal at Cornell works, there, as Terry said, there is nothing particularly special about the subsurface geology in Ithaca, and it can go anywhere. And um, if we can do that, um, you know, and again, um, Terry talked about in the Northeast, especially, we use an awful lot of energy for heating, and almost all of that heating energy is coming from burning stuff. And, 
we've got to stop burning stuff. So I'm especially, I remain especially excited about this project and, and hopeful that it can be transformative to the a piece of the, the huge transformations, positive transformations underway in the energy system now. And Frank, is, is your hand up again, or is it the stale hand? <laughs> it's actually up again. And since nobody's breaking down the barricades to ask questions, I'm going to squeeze in a second one. Um, assuming that it isn't fractured enough uh, to be able to uh, get water from one pipe to another, is the intent then to fracture it? And if so, how would you keep it open, given the pressures involved? Yeah. Um, so I should say that there are some places on earth, like around Paris, France, where natural porosity is sufficient, that they've been doing this for 25 years, and it's very functional. 700,000 residential customers or something like this get heat, their heat this way. Um, they, they are lucky geologically. Uh, if the rocks are not sufficiently fractured or the fractures are partly mineral filled or something like ones at Kubo at our site, then the question becomes whether the stress field and the fractures are oriented relative to each other in a way that would make a little bit of fracture enhancement through whether it's chemical means or pressure means, you know, could, could they, Ooch open the existing fractures enough to make more water flow through them. Um, and, and so that really is the first of the design questions that's being addressed now that we have data and decisions will have to be made. Um, how would they be kept open, open afterwards? Uh, that also is apparently a real problem. <laughs> you force them open and as soon as you let the pressure off, they close back down. Um, conceptually, the idea is that the the sides of a fracture are not perfect planes, they're irregular things, and they would never close back together with the two walls mated together perfectly. That's the idea. I, I do not know whether it's um, very realistic. In um, fracking for oil and gas, they also pump in sand into the cracks to hold them open and, and sometimes actually little ceramic spheres um, to hold cracks open. I don't know if that's in the discussion for Kubo, but I know that's part of the oil and gas um, industry operations. Maybe one more question or maybe not. Well, thank you all. And if you've got uh, thoughts on any of this, uh, let us know. I think our contact info is in that Google Doc, and, and you all know how to find me anyway. <laughs> yes, thank you all. Please, please feel free to, to share ideas or suggestions as well. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for presenters, and thanks, Don, for facilitating and presenting. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.